Every year, Buddhist pilgrims from around the world come to Bodh Gaya to pay homage to the Buddha. This sacred place is believed to be the center of the universe, the navel of the earth, where Buddhas, past and future, attain complete enlightenment. India. An ancient land has produced many diverse religions and cultures over the course of her extensive history. Today, the majority of people in India subscribe to one religious belief or another. Buddhism, considered one of the world's great religions, originated from India. It is not surprising then that India commands a special place in the hearts of Buddhists. Buddhists come to India to retrace the steps of the founder of Buddhism, commemorate his achievements, and celebrate the venerated representation of enlightenment, the Buddha. The founder of Buddhism, Siddhartha Gautama, was born in 623 BC in the kingdom of Kapilavastu in ancient India, in what is today Nepal. To commemorate his joyous birth, his father, King Suddhodana, invited many renowned sages to a naming ceremony for his son. Among them was an old sage who prophesied that the young prince would eventually give up his kingdom to become an ascetic and ultimately a fully enlightened Buddha. As Prince Siddhartha was growing up, King Suddhodana recruited the best teachers in the kingdom to educate him. He was very diligent in his learning and became a talented young man, renowned for his wit and courage. The prince grew into a gentleman and was full of love, kindness and compassion for all people and living creatures. Meanwhile, his father, the king, was deeply anxious about the prophecy of his sons renouncing the kingdom. So he lavished him with all manner of wealth and luxuries, hoping this would distract him from any thoughts of renunciation. But on one of his outings beyond the palace walls, Prince Siddhartha witnessed for the very first time old age, sickness and death, and the peaceful countenance of an ascetic. What he saw weighed heavily on him and made him deeply contemplative. Siddhartha was 29 when he renounced his kingdom and left his wife and son in search of the truth. He spent the next six years practicing austerities, but when this failed to yield the answers he sought, he gave up the practice of austerities. After accepting a bowl of rice milk from a village girl named Sujata, who nursed him back to health, he made his way to Gaya. Upon arrival, a grass cutter offered him a pile of kusha grass for a cushion. He then sat under a ficus religiosa tree in Bodh Gaya for 49 days, contemplating deeply about life and trying to find an end to cyclic existence. Finally, on a full moon night, Siddhartha gained complete realization and became a fully enlightened Buddha. Henceforth, the ficus religiosa became known as the Bodhi tree. Bodhi refers to awakening, and thus the place associated with Buddha's awakening became known as Bodh Gaya, also known as Buddha Gaya. Bodh Gaya is situated around 150 kilometers south of the city of Patna. During Visak Day, which falls every year on the full moon day of May, devout Buddhists make their way to Bodh Gaya to commemorate the birth, enlightenment and parinirvana of the Buddha. The arid summer month of May attracts many devotees from tropical countries like Thailand, Sri Lanka and Vietnam. Bodh Gaya is considered the holiest of the holy sites because it is here 
where past and future Buddhas are believed to attain enlightenment. It is said that a total of 1,000 Buddhas will attain realization and enlightenment in this one place. In our literature, Buddhist literature, it says all the past Buddhas, past Buddhas, they all come to for their final bliss or to attainment of uh, enlightening, they come to Bodhigaya, especially the past Buddhas, and also in the future Buddhas, they also in their term when they about to become enlightenment, so they are coming to Bodhigaya. Every year, the management committee of Bodh Gaya hosts a grand celebration, inviting the Sangha and local officials to come together to commemorate Visa. <laughs> On the full moon night, the temple organizes cultural performances and invites various groups to put up Buddhist-related performances. Devotees celebrate Visa in their own ways. Some offer lamps and pray for wisdom and liberation from suffering. Others pay homage to the Buddha in groups and chant the scriptures in praise of the triple gems, the Buddha, Dharma and Sangha. On this night, devotees immerse themselves thoroughly in Buddhism, as if they were living in the time of the Buddha himself. The month of May is hot and humid, so Buddhists from other parts of the world prefer to visit Bodh Gaya at the end of the year, when the weather is cooler. There are even direct flights offered at this time of the year, so travel becomes more expedient and convenient. One common sight in Bodh Gaya during this season are maroon-robed monks called Lamas. Many of them come from around India or neighboring Nepal and Bhutan. Most of them come to Bodh Gaya to participate in the Monlam or Great Prayer Festival. The Monlam or Great Prayer Festival is organized primarily to pray for happiness, peace and good health. It also serves to commemorate Lord Buddha. The Monlam was started by Lama Tsongkhapa, founder of the Gelukpa sect of Tibetan Buddhism in 1409. The inaugural Great Prayer Festival was held in the Jokang Temple in Lhasa. The Kagyu sect of Tibetan Buddhism also organizes the Monlam in Bodh Gaya every year. According to estimates, close to 10,000 Sangha members and lay devotees participate in the Monlam every year. The first Karmapa, the head of the Kagyu sect, was credited with establishing the unique system of reincarnated lamas in Tibet. To date, the current Karmapa is the 17th in the successive line of incarnations. The Karmapa stressed that the aims and benefits of Monlam are not restricted to one religion, but universal and directed towards all sentient beings. <laughs> The Karmapa advised everyone at the Monlam to cherish the opportunity to make positive aspirations and practice hard in order to purify all negative karma and accumulate positive merits. 
The Karmapa also emphasized that the ideal place to accumulate merits is in front of the Vajra seat in Bodhgaya. One's body and speech act as a support to cultivate positive mental habits, as well as sow the seeds of merit, so they are extremely beneficial for one's cultivation. The Karmapa also said, now that we've obtained the precious human rebirth, come in contact with the Buddha Dharma and come to such a sacred place. We should cherish it and contemplate on it. We should treasure the teachings and bear them in mind so we do not waste this good fortune and opportunity. The Kagyu Monlam consists of many activities, one of which is led by the Karmapa and involves hundreds of lamas carrying the scriptures and circumambulating the stupa. While doing so, the Karmapa, as well as all the Rinpoches and Lamas, don their golden robes and hats as a sign of respect to the Dharma. The ceremony also involves the offering of alms, with the public offering food to the Sangha. The Tibetans believe the offering of alms follows a tradition set by the Buddha. When the end of the year approaches, and the weather turns colder and more comfortable, many lamas begin doing full prostrations at the holy site. Many devotees follow their example while paying homage to the Buddha. Doing prostrations is the primary means of showing repentance. It is an expression of respect as well as a way to eliminate one's pride and ego. During prostration, one lowers one's head to the ground and as a result, elevates the object of veneration to a higher place. This helps to purify the negative karma associated with pride. While doing prostrations, one should stay concentrated and focused in order to achieve the intended results. Some Buddhists prefer to do the three steps, one bow, which in terms of significance is similar to the full prostration. The aim is to transform one's ego clinging to loving kindness and compassion. Buddhist practitioners often like to face the Buddha statue while chanting the scriptures, as this is akin to hearing the Dharma from the Buddha's own mouth. This helps to remind oneself to practice diligently, avoid evil, and do good. Scripture chanting originated in the time of Shakyamuni Buddha. In the past, the words of the Buddha were passed via oral transmission. Disciples of the Buddha often memorized and repeated the words of the Buddha when they preached the Dharma. This involved familiarizing oneself with a particular scripture and making the effort to commit it to memory. This continues today, with the chanting of scriptures still the basic tool of learning and spreading the Dharma. Other devotees prefer to engage in silent meditation, either beneath the Bodhi tree or in front of the Vajra seat. Settling into a state of deep peace and serenity, they follow in the Buddha's footsteps and embark on the path to enlightenment. Here, Buddhists usually perform certain rites and rituals to show their respect to the Buddha, such as the offering of water, flowers, fruits, incense and lamps. Robes are also offered to the statue of the Buddha installed here. And on auspicious days and during special events, the same statue is painted gold. Every ethnic group has its own customs and traditions. People who come from different countries naturally subscribe to their respective cultures and traditions when they pay their respects to holy objects. This elderly couple from Sri Lanka pay their respects to the Buddha by hanging up a small white cloth beneath the Bodhi tree. Now we will go there and tie this. We tie it here, through which, through the power of Lord Buddha, 
दो दम एंड संग वी एक्सपेक्ट ऑल बैड ओमेंट्स एंड बैड थिंग्स विल बी रेस्ट ऑफ एंड थ्रू द पावर ऑफ लॉर्ड बुद्ध ऑल गुड थिंग्स विल हैपन टू हिम एंड टू हिज फैमिली इट इज अ ट्रेडिशन इन श्रीलंका दैट वेन पीपल ग्रो ओल्ड दे आर चिल्ड्रन स्पेंड फॉर देम टू गो टू दीज होली प्लेसेस इट मे बी इन साइड द कंट्री ओ आउट साइड द कंट्री इवन श्रीलंका श्रीलंका इज नॉट अ रिच कंट्री यू नो इवन दो द विलेज पीपल इज यू नो इज अ वंडरफुल द विलेज पीपल दे कलेक्ट मनी दे कलेक्ट मनी डूइंग small small things doing a small small business you know cooking you know weaving maybe for 5 years for 10 years why to one day i want to go and visit both gaya they come from vietnam and have a special way of expressing their veneration for the buddha the monks will cut a tuft of hair from the devotee and scatter it upon the soil of both gaya we are save our hair so that we become the the tribes of the buddha you get the help strong happy nick property all our sorrow and we will be true i when i have my hair i will spare it in this land every people come here and step to my hair it's me that i bring peace fun to all other people and property and happy nick all all you think these chinese are part of a group from myanmar They've made the trip specially to Bodh Gaya and have taken refuge in the Triple Gem. They chant the scriptures, meditate, and engage in activities to express their gratitude to the Buddha. Kim Phu Bodh Sa Zai Yi Ji, dan liang ye hen da, ro ye hao xiang zi qi zhao dao zi qi de yi ge guang ming de da lu, bang zi qi yi xie wu ming de yi qie du diu diao. Steve from Switzerland often comes to Bodh Gaya on a pilgrimage with his family. He feels that being here in person helps to strengthen his Buddhist faith. Just looking at pictures or even looking at this DVD, well, it gives you some inspiration. But being here, only touching the ground here, only actually breathing the the, the air. Uh, which Buddha was breathing, seeing the environment here, uh, that is really a blessing for your body, speech, and mind. It isn't only Buddhists who come to Bodh Gaya. Devotees of other religions also make pilgrimages here. The Hindu people believe Buddha as the uh, the god or the incarnation of uh, the Vishnu God. You know. so they believe and they they have this rest rest so that's why wherever buddha statue hindu people go definitely they go and pay respect as their god thus the so many hindu people each year come to pay respect to this place like today's pilgrims buddhists of the distant past also came to india from far away places the most famous being master suen chang who hailed from the china of the tang dynasty he was not only renowned worldwide as an outstanding translator of buddhist scriptures but he was also one of the greatest adventurers of ancient china his journey to the west from china to india on a quest to collect and collate the scriptures spanned 50000 miles and 17 years he also devoted his life to translating a total of 1335 scrolls of buddhist scriptures master xuan zhang also spent a year recording his experiences in what is now known as the great tang records of the western regions this book documents all his experiences of his more than a decade long itinerant journey and it remains a rich source of knowledge about the history and geography of ancient central asia especially regions like afghanistan pakistan and india in 627 ad master xuan zhang left the tang capital of chang'an of modern day xi'an and after overcoming all sorts of difficulties and dangers finally arrived in northern india around the summer of 629 ad from there he made his way to central india taking in the six holy sites along the way in the great tang records on the western regions master xuan zhang 
described witnessing the Mahabodhi Temple in Bodhi Gaya at a height of approximately 170 feet. The Bodhi tree was surrounded by brick walls and the tree was 50 feet tall. While Master Xuan Zhang was doing his prostrations beneath the Bodhi tree, he spontaneously burst into tears when he thought about the Buddha preaching the Dharma while he was alive and how he did not have the good fortune of seeing and hearing the Buddha himself. Following that, Master Xuan Zhang went to the most renowned Buddhist institute in India, Nalanda University, to learn the Dharma. The reason why a temple was constructed in both Gaya is to commemorate the Bodhi tree and the fact that the Buddha practiced and gained enlightenment here. The earliest shrine was constructed by the Buddhist king Asoka back in 3 BC. Later kings raised the shrine by another 50 meters by building the magnificent Mahabodhi temple over it. Some scholars estimated this to be around 2 AD. Later kings and influential pilgrims from India, Sri Lanka and Myanmar also pitched in with reconstruction, repair and expansion works on the temple. In the 12th century, Turkic or Mughal invaders destroyed the temple and Buddhism fell into decline. In 1590, a Shiva devotee came to the surrounding areas of Bodh Gaya and established his own sect and temple here. His followers gradually took control of the Mahabodhi temple, but they did not take good care of it, letting it fall into disrepair, and it succumbed to the ravages of nature. In 1861, the English archaeologist Alexander Cunningham visited the area and implored the local authorities to excavate and restore the temple. Only in 1887 did serious reconstruction work really commence. He wrote in his diary, The excavation works were really monotonous. Every night before I slept, I used to read the Great Tang Records on the Western Regions, where Master Xuan Zhang described in great detail the famous Bodhi tree and its surrounding Buddha statues and temple grounds. Very soon, we found a large number of relics which bore close resemblance to the descriptions in the book. Cunningham followed the descriptions of Master Xuan Zhang closely in the reconstruction of the temple. Even information on the decorative motifs and construction materials came from the Great Tang records on the western regions. The current resplendent Vajra seat beneath the Bodhi tree used to be a slab of red sandstone measuring 2.4 meters in length, 1.4 meters width and 90 centimeters in height and it was excavated from Mahabodhi temple by Cunningham but it was broken in many places. According to the excavation records the Vajra seat was constructed by King Asoka and placed in its current position by Cunningham after the excavation. There is a Buddha statue in the main shrine, positioned here by Cunningham. It was then greenish-black in color, but over the years, Tibetan pilgrims practicing of pasting gold foil on it transformed it into the golden statue we see today. The Mahabodhi Temple in Bodhi Gaya was named a World Heritage Site by UNESCO in 2002. The Mahabodhi Temple is shaped like a pyramid, the first level is a square, with each side measuring 15 meters in length, and it spirals upwards into a bronze spire, giving the stupa a harmonious sense of balance. At each of the four corners of the first level sits a similarly shaped but smaller stupa. There is a stone plaque in front of the main entrance towards the east. On both sides of the main entrance, one can find niches filled with gold-plated Buddha statues. The relief sculptures on the four sides of the stupa are framed by horseshoe-shaped arched doors representing the earlier Buddhist monasteries. The other three sides of the Mahabodhi temple contain over 60 stone railings measuring two meters high. These were made between the second and fifth century. Most of the current stone railings are replicas since the original ones have been installed in various museums as exhibits. 
Towards the left of the path leading to the temple, one can find a round stone seat with the Buddha's footprint carved on it. Besides that, at the Vajra seat and railings around the Bodhi tree, one can also find two round black stone seats with gigantic Buddha footprints carved on them. This elaborate piece of art never fails to kindle one's imagination. After the Buddha attained enlightenment, he remained beneath the Bodhi tree and meditated on the Vajra seat for seven days. On the second week, the Buddha stood atop a small hill and gazed uninterrupted at the Bodhi tree, full of gratitude for the shade it had provided him throughout his days of meditation. On the third week, the Buddha did walking meditation at the north face of the Mahabodhi temple. Currently, there is a long platform erected here, and there are lotus flower stone sculptures on the platform, symbolizing lotus flowers blooming beneath the feet of Buddha wherever he walked. Walking meditation, which originated from the practice of Theravada Buddhism, has become an important part of modern-day meditation. Walking meditation consists of focusing pointedly on every single action of the body while one is engaged in the act of walking. One is aware but unfettered by discursive thoughts in the mind and external distractions. Through the practice of determination, one maintains a balanced and patient mind. On the fourth week, the Buddha engaged in the practice of meditation here, contemplating on the law of cause and effect, where every phenomenon arises as a result of prior causes and conditions. Today, this place has become a highly treasured practice ground where ordained and lay Tibetan Buddhists engage with utmost devotion in the practice of full-length prostrations, in the pursuit of full enlightenment. On the fifth week after the Buddha's enlightenment, he sat down to meditate beneath a poplar tree, and it was here where he advised a Brahmin. It is not through birth, but through actions, that one is considered a Brahmin. This place is currently located along the main route towards the main shrine in the Mahabodhi temple. On the sixth week of the Buddha's enlightenment, he entered into deep concentration in this very place. And just then, a raging storm beckoned, and the Naga king appeared and provided the Buddha with shelter against the relentless storm. This place is actually symbolic because according to records, the actual location where this took place is three kilometers south of the Lotus Pond. On the seventh week, the Buddha sat here in meditation, and upon completion, he received offerings of biscuits and honey from two merchants who took refuge in him. They became the earliest lay followers of the Buddha, even before the official Sangha was established. The Buddha attained enlightenment under the Bodhi tree, which is why it commands such a sacred place in the hearts of Buddhists. Some people who aspire to be a monastic have, after careful consideration, specially chosen to be ordained in this special place. The current tree is actually a sapling transplanted from the original Bodhi tree. In 3rd BC, King Asoka gave orders for the tree to be chopped and the trunk to be burned. However, he later converted to Buddhism and the tree was allowed to grow and flourish, to bear new sprouts and take on a new lease of life. King Asoka grew to be very pious and often paid homage to the Bodhi tree. But his wife was extremely jealous and instigated someone to cut it down. To revive the tree, King Asoka nurtured it with milk every day, and as a result, the tree started bearing new shoots. Around 6 AD, King Shashank, a follower of the Shiva sect, gave orders for the tree to be uprooted. But fortunately, its roots were intact, and a new tree sprang up yet again. The Bodhi tree not only suffered man-made destruction, but it also suffered the wrath of Mother Nature. The current Bodhi tree, the object of such veneration, is of the fifth generation. 
King Ahsoka, the king of the Maurya dynasty, loved visiting holy places associated with the Buddha, Bodh Gaya being one of them. As a Buddhist, he strongly supported the spread of Buddhism, and under his patronage, Buddhism spread throughout the whole of India. He also sent his son Mahindra, an ordained monk, to spread Buddhism in Sri Lanka. King Asoka later tasked his daughter Sangamitra, an ordained nun, and a group of specialists to bring a sapling of the Bodhi tree from Bodh Gaya to Sri Lanka, as well as spread the Bhikkhuni vows, resulting in the establishment of the first Bhikkhuni Sangha in Sri Lanka. Under royal patronage, Buddhism became Sri Lanka's main religion, and even today, the island nation is regarded as center of Buddhism. The Bodhi tree continues to flourish today, at the very same spot where it had been transplanted. This Bodhi tree with the golden pillars, you can see the small branch. That is the actual Bodhi tree, which was planted in uh, 288 BC. The other Bodhi trees have been planted uh, as uh, guardian trees. You know, when it was alone, there can be a lot of problems. So, just to protect the Bodhi tree from any natural disaster or anything, so they have been uh, planted here. This tree has been well researched and documented as the oldest on record and is viewed as a national treasure by Sri Lankans. The Mahavansa, the great chronicle of Sri Lanka, is a very important historical document in Sri Lanka. It is well accepted and respected by the historians the world over. There, we find the whole history of the Bodhi tree. And apart from that, we also have Bodhi Vansa. Bodhi Vansa is particularly written for Bodhi tree. Everything about the Bodhi tree, uh, the arrival of the Bodhi tree, uh, the, the history of the Bodhi tree, uh, whosoever came, what are the rituals, uh, you know, everything is written there in uh, Bodhi Vansa. The Bodhi tree is taken care of by a group of specialists, and it's said that some of these people are the descendants of those who centuries ago brought the Bodhi sapling over from India. The Bodhi tree is the symbol of the Buddha's enlightenment, which is why it is widely respected. Today, paying homage to the Bodhi tree has become part and parcel of the religious life of Sri Lankan Buddhists. The saplings of the Bodhi tree in Sri Lanka have been transplanted to many parts of the world, bearing testimony to the truly global spread of Buddhism. In 1891, a young Sri Lankan, Dharmapala, visited Bodhi Gaya. The Mahabodhi temple had just been restored by a British archaeologist, but a local Shiva priest by the name of Mahanta claimed possession of the temple, though he was not able to produce any form of official documentation to prove it. Back then, there was no one maintaining the temple. The whole place was filthy, overgrown with wild shrubs, and there were broken Buddha statues scattered around. Dharmapala was extremely depressed upon seeing the place in such a pathetic state. So he made a vow beneath the Bodhi tree and pledged his best to maintain and protect this holy site. With that, he started waging a campaign to regain Buddhist control of the Mahabodhi temple. When our founder came on a pilgrimage, he found the deplorable condition of this sacred place. Then he decided to form a kind of organization which can uh, communicate with the Buddhist world and get assistance from the Buddhist countries to save this sacred place for the Buddhist world. Uh, the other objectives is that to open some kind of charitable activities surrounding these uh, sacred places, uh, Buddha Gaya, Saranath, Kushinara, uh, such places. In 1892, Dharmapala founded the Mahabodhi Society in Kolkata, then the capital of India. This made it more convenient to establish contact with people of authority and approach them for help. In the same year, he started publishing the first international Buddhist publication, Mahabodhi Journal, to create public awareness and seek global support. 
He visited Buddhist countries and traveled to the West to garner interest and support among Buddhists in his bid to regain the holy place. He met uh, so many of the great personalities in India, like uh, Mahatma Gandhi and like uh, Jawaharlal Nehru and Rabindranath Tagore and Swami Vivekanand, such as very big personalities he met and he uh, asked their support to save this uh, Buddha Gaya temple, especially. Many important figures in India, such as Mahatma Gandhi, had expressed their view that Buddhists should own the rights to the Mahabodhi temple. Finally, in 1949, the Bodh Gaya Temple Act was passed, paving the way for a Bodh Gaya Temple Management Committee to be set up to manage the temple's affairs. The members comprised four Buddhists and four Hindus, including Mahanta. The chairman was to be the district magistrate of Gaya, and he had to be a Hindu. Since then, the Mahabodhi temple has been under the jurisdiction of this committee. Temple is not belong to one person. No. Temple is not Temple is a very world. It is not a world. Even today, some Indian Buddhist monks are still hopeful that the 1949 Bodh Gaya Temple Act will be revised and that the temple will one day be wholly managed by Buddhists. Bodh Gaya is the foremost sacred place in the minds of Buddhists. A pilgrimage to India is not complete without coming to the source of Buddhism, the place where the Buddha practiced austerities the place where he became enlightened and the place where he preached the wheel of Dharma. Devout Buddhists around the world aspire to visit these places. Surrounding both Gaya are many holy places associated with the Buddha. East of Mahabodhi Temple, beyond the bustling town, lies the Niranjan River, where the Buddha engaged in the practice of austerities. Having left the palace, he came to the forest here as Prince Siddhartha and engaged in the practice of extreme austerities, subsisting on one grain of rice a day. He became severely emaciated, yet for six years he could not find a way towards liberation. He stumbled into the river for a wash and due to his frailty, eventually passed out and went into a coma. Just as he started examining his practice over the years, he heard a tune from afar containing these lyrics. Like the strings of the sitar, the loose ones will not produce a sound, the tight ones will break. Only those which are neither loose nor tight will produce the best music. Upon hearing these words, Prince Siddhartha finally realized that neither extreme austerities nor indulgence in pleasures could lead to one's realization. It was only through the middle way and the practice of meditation that one could attain enlightenment. So he decided to end his practice of austerities. The locals refer to the Niranjan River as the Palgu River. During drought, when the water level is low, the middle of the river is stacked with sand, resembling an open sandy desert. However, during the rainy season, it turns into an expansive river. One can imagine how magnificent the undulating river looked back then, just by looking at its banks, which stretch over 30 to 40 meters. Moving forward from the banks of the Naranjan River, one approaches the village where Sujata, the milkmaid, used to live. If Sujata did not offer Prince Siddhartha rice milk back then, he might not have had enough energy to make his way to the Bodhi tree, and Buddhism might not have existed. In order to commemorate Sujata's act of kindness, King Asoka erected an 11-meter stupa over her house. Not far from here, there is another small shrine erected by the villagers in honor of Sujata, which contains a statue of her offering the rice milk, which tourists visit to pay their respects to. Not far from the shrine sits a pavilion, and within this lies a well. This is where Buddha subdued the Kashyapa brothers. 
The three brothers were the followers of the fire god, and they kept a fire dragon in the dungeon. In order to convert the Kashipa brothers, the Buddha stayed overnight in their place. During the night, the fire dragon breathed out toxic fumes to hurt the Buddha, but got subdued by him instead. The heretical Kashipa took refuge in the Buddha and contributed greatly to the subsequent growth of Buddhism. In the vicinity lies the Mucharam village, and within it lies the Muchalinda pond where the Naga king tried to protect the Buddha from the raging storm after his enlightenment. The place retains its original charm due to the fact that it's yet to be developed. As one ventures along this ancient trail, one can see entire green fields of kusha grass. It is anyone's guess if the soft grass offered to Prince Siddhartha back then actually originated from here. Surrounding both Gaya, one can find numerous Buddhist temples and meditation centers from around the world. Each has its own unique architectural style, which gives this town a truly cosmopolitan feel. Although Buddhism originated from India, it spread to different countries and many local cultures and customs became assimilated into Buddhism. This includes not just the distinct architectural styles of temples, but also the unique craftsmanship of Buddha statues. This is of great benefit to pilgrims from different parts of the world, as they have the rare opportunity to understand and experience different Buddhist cultures and traditions in this one place. Many Buddhist centers organize regular events and ceremonies, as well as offer accommodation to provide devotees with the most favorable conditions to carry out their pilgrimages or engage in more long-term practice. Some also provide aid to the poor villagers nearby. Among the oldest is the Mahabodhi Society set up by Dhammapala. His main project was to establish one uh, pilgrimage center. That time there was no any place to sleep to the pilgrims. So he decided I want to make one pilgrimage rest or dharmashala. Uh, thus he started this building in 1901. This was the first building in Bodhgaya that time served to the, all the pilgrimage who visited this place. So this was the first project in Bodhgaya. After the death of Dhammapala, the Mahabodhi Society continued his legacy in Bodhgaya and other holy Buddhist sites by restoring Buddhist relics, rebuilding temples, providing pilgrims with accommodation, boosting education through building research institutes, schools, libraries, museums, and a Buddhist publishing firm. This allowed many Indians and Westerners to learn more about Buddhism. It is today the main driving force for the Buddhist revival in India. They've also set up clinics to provide villagers with medical aid and services. Shakyamuni Buddha Community Health Care Center, established by the Root Institute, is another center which provides medical services to poor villages. The center is run by a group of specialized medical professionals and volunteers. It provides a comprehensive range of medical services, from general consultation to physical rehabilitation, tuberculosis management to the care of child AIDS patients. Every month, the medical center caters to more than 3,000 patients seeking medical advice. As a result, the center requires considerable manpower, and this has provided employment opportunities for many. When I came here, I was only one. Now we have more than 25 professional and support staff supporting people, and they are uh, they're getting job here. This is uh, one of the very happiest in their lives. Prevention is better than cure, which is why the medical center has initiated community health ambassador projects to spread the importance of health care and hygiene in many villages. Well, we do work in the mobile villages, but we only go there one day a week. We need to try and get the villagers themselves or people within the villages to start recognizing their own health problems and train them up and work them towards solving their health problems. So that was one of the main aims of the community health workers. Both Gaia 
is situated in Bihar in northern India, one of the country's poorest regions. As this is the site of Buddha's enlightenment, many Buddhists come here to accumulate merit. They emulate the Buddha spirit of great compassion and do their part to alleviate human suffering by offering love and care to those less fortunate. This gave the local people very good example if the Buddhist peoples do this kind of the services in this area, the local peoples, they understand they are really doing real uh, dedication, what Buddha always said, help the people, help who need to kind, help who need compassion, make them happy. So they give very good example, not only to going to the temple as a monk, doing some puja and this and that thing, but these kinds of services run by the Buddhist organization or Buddhist people, make the people locally to inspire. They are really following the Buddha way. Ms. Huang Minyi, a volunteer from Taiwan, is one who has benefited from this excellent opportunity. Throughout her time at Bodh Gaya, she's made friends with many Indian children and in the process uncovered a priceless jewel from the depths of her heart. The abbot of this Vietnamese temple comes from Germany. Apart from managing the temple, he makes use of his time at Bodh Gaya to deepen his own Dharma practice with fellow devotees from different parts of the world. You can uh, list many famous monks, the Dharma teaching, but, but after you can choose what is good for you. This is so, this practice is I like and I do. I learning from any people. But after I, I think back, this, if good, I learning. If no good, I throw out. Although they barely know each other, and despite the vast differences in their cultural and educational backgrounds, they share an important similarity, a sincere wish to seek the truth. They come together from different corners of the world to both Gaia, with the Buddha as the main source of inspiration, taking him as the perfect example with the same goal and intention in mind, they follow in the Buddha's footsteps in the pursuit of complete enlightenment. Bodhi Gaya! 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 They come with one aim, to offer their highest respects and greatest gratitude to the Buddha. This place, where the Buddha attained enlightenment, will remain in their hearts forever. This place called Bodh Gaya.